Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Executive Director of Software Freedom Conservancy and a man with many affiliations that you are probably aware of, Bradley Kuhn. So the benefit that we have of FOSDEM being early in the year is I introduce my new talk for the year often at FOSDEM, although this is the first time it's been a talk on my own. I've been doing mostly panels uh, in this endeavor until now. And so this is actually the first time I've been up here by, I had to talk with Karen once, but now to talk all by myself at FOSDEM. This is my first time speaking alone at FOSDEM, as it turns out. And it, it's about an issue that relates to things that have been talked about in previous years in our dev room. Uh, two years ago, John Sullivan gave a talk uh, called Is Copyleft Being Framed? about this whole idea that people don't like copyleft anymore and copyleft is on the decline. We see story after story about that. And I, I don't really know about the data, that people say there's data that says it's so, data that says it isn't. But I'm more concerned about the socio-political reasons that people believe this to be true, whether or not it's true, almost doesn't matter, because thinking makes it so. People are starting to believe it, and I think there's a reason that's true, and it has to do with politics. Now, I grew up in uh, a part of the U.S. that's right on what's called the Mason-Dixon line. I'm from Maryland, um, so it's almost, so northerners think I'm a southerner in the U.S., and southerners think I'm a northerner. But there's a certain amount of su southern sen sensibility in Baltimore, Maryland, where I grew up. And thus, my mother taught me that you're never supposed to discuss politics and religion in polite company. These topics are too controversial. You might guess that I was a somewhat rebellious child. It's pretty obvious uh, that, I, that I must have been. So I really believe that we have to talk about politics. It's essential. Because anything that's worth doing in the world is going to be completely soaked in political problems, in political discussion, in political debate. And that's not necessarily bad, because politics is, is uh, actually defined as the social structure that's created when three or more people are involved in a topic. That's all, really. It's about interacting as a community. and. The fact is, our community is a very treacherous, dangerous political system. But most people don't notice this because I could give a whole other talk, and Karen Sandler's working on a talk in, of this type, about how there's all these kinds of proxy wars and proxy ways of doing the politics such that they're sometimes hidden, but they're there. Now, most of what are the fundamental principles are vaguely religious in the sense that they're not things that are facts, they're things that people believe. And I simply believe in a principle which at FOSDEM I have a much friendlier audience. When I use this slide at say a Linux Foundation conference it's a little different. But here most people in the room probably have similar beliefs that everyone should have the right to copy, modify, and redistribute all the software in their computer and that should be somehow an inalienable right. I wish it were in the, we talked last year about how it should maybe be in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and I think it should. I think we'll never get it into the UN Declaration of Human Rights, but it should be there. And I have no problem, as most people in this room probably don't, at using a license to make sure that we maximize the freedom. Taking the legal system we have, hacking it in the copyleft sense, and making use of it to spread as much software freedom as possible. I still believe that developers have the right to make this choice. And I don't admonish developers who choose a non-copyleft license. But I want to be clear that these kinds of things are moral beliefs, but the idea that software should have the possibility of being proprietorized is itself a moral belief as well. And I think the proprietary software people somehow think there's already an inalienable right to proprietorize software simply because it's allowed by law. But that's a moral position as well. So we have two moral positions that are basically diametrically opposed. And that's why we end up with debates about whether copyleft should exist, whether we should use copyleft, whether copyleft is a reasonable thing and a good thing. And these debates have gotten worse over the years. They got better for a while, and then they got worse. And they're worse than they've ever had been now, in my view. I've been around the free software world since before there was a term open source. 
I went to the very first OSCOM, which was a one-day event, um, where amusingly, uh, Richard Stallman was not on a panel, but he came up to ask a question and then turned the microphone around and started giving a speech to the audience. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but that's RMS, of course. Um, that was 1998. I was also at OSCON 2001 when they did this thing called the Great Debate. And we actually, this is, I still worked for FSF at the time, and we were pretty upset that, that Stallman wasn't in the Great Debate against Craig Mundy, um, that it was a bunch of non-copyleft folks, basically. Uh, and it was sort of said, Tim O'Reilly, you should read the Meme Hustler, the article about Tim O'Reilly. He's, he's, a, he's a pretty shady guy in a lot of ways. And he, set, he was setting up this, setting this up for failure in some sense. Because well, was it Monday the guy that said it's a cancer? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Microsoft is in the middle. At this moment in 2001, as Tom points out, Microsoft was in the middle of this anti-copyleft campaign. It was incredibly politically smart. It was the politi most politically smart I've ever seen Microsoft be in their history. They said they looked at the free software world and saw that the fault line that they could start an earthquake at was between copyleft and non-copyleft. And they tried. They tried hard. And I was a little terrified because I thought that was a very weak fault line and that even a little bit of shaking would cause us all to fall into the rift. But Brian sat up there and he defended copyleft. In fact, that, that night before, sitting in the hotel before he was going on this panel, he and I were sitting there at the lobby of the hotel, and he said to me, it's really important that you're there. I'm sorry you're not in the debate, but I'm, it's really important that you exist. Because if copyleft isn't there, all of a sudden, us non-copyleft people are radicals. And I'm not a radical, Brian says to me. I'm a, I'm a moderate. I'm, a, I'm so moderate that it's boring. And without the copyleft people there, Microsoft will move the line, and they'll turn me into a radical. So he sat on that panel, and he defended copyleft. Now, I, I don't think Apache Software Foundation people would do this today. I, I, I see Apache Software Foundation people, whom I generally get along with, they're, they're much more anti, rapidly anti-copyleft than, than they ever were in those days. And, and, and that fault line didn't crack at the time. Microsoft lost that political battle. Because we all stood together as a community, we, the copyleft folks said, hey, non-copyleft licenses are great. The non-copyleft folks said, hey, the copyleft licenses are great. And it all worked out. This got me thinking about how political movements tend to work. I, I've been a radical for a long time. Uh, and I got beat up in high school, which explains a lot of my behavior, by the way. Um, <laughs> and one of the things I got beat up for was because I helped start the environmental club in my school. And now I was in high school in the 1980s and the, early, the very early 1990s. And there was no recycling. The paper just got tossed in landfills. And so we scavenged a bunch of cardboard boxes and put them in every room. And every Friday we collect them. And we got a truck to come to pick up the recycling. Because you actually had to contract for this. There wasn't any municipal pickup of any kind of recycling, at least in Baltimore, Maryland in the 1980s. There is now, of course. And I don't think there are many schools anywhere in the world that would consider not recycling their paper. They, they kind of have to. Because somebody would get really upset. At least, you know, talking U.S. and Europe, the, you know, the, the rich world, I guess I should say. That as an issue, environmentalism has to be sort of part of, a little bit of environmentalism. I can get to that in a minute. Has to be part of what you're always doing. You can't get away. And that's progress, right? I'm sure students in the high school I went to today don't have to start an environmental club and get beat up for it just to get the school to start recycling. Now, I, I moved to this co- oh, that's the wrong image, it made it, the slide scrub, sorry about that. Um, so I just moved in this co-working facility, and it's the marketing at this co-working facility, this is their marketing page, which was not supposed to be that big and it should have more points, but that's fine. Um, the, all about this, this eco-friendly stuff. Now, um, I, I'll just speak through the points that are at the end, as it turns out, I was here for two years, I actually never saw them recycle anything, right? The, the, the woman came and collected the trash and she would just dump it all into one bin and I asked her about it and she said, that's what they told me to do. And I wrote to the people about it and they said, oh no, no, there's recycling. And a thing I get, I've, I've been told in New York City before by other buildings that, oh yeah, there's a special place where we sort it all out later and we, we pull it back again. <laughs> you put it all into one big bin and then you pull it all out later. 
and, and this is incredibly common, but they, ha they want to market this way. This is, a, this is a marketing scheme that works. And this is co-option. This is taking a movement, a cause, and taking its principles and giving them lip service, but not actually being engaged in the principles, trying to cut every corner you can. And this happens to most political movements. Most social justice movements go through a phase of co-option. And sometimes they're in a phase of co-option for a very long time. I think the environmental movement has been stuck in this co-option phase for a long time. Once it's the right thing to do, it's better just to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. We're a green company. We believe in green principles, all that sort of thing. And what for-profit companies realize is once people kind of expect a certain amount of social responsibility in any given area, be it environmentalism, free software, they're going to try to use what they can of it when it's useful, uh, and they'll throw away the rest. And I think that's what's happening in free software. And what Microsoft realized really early, and most other companies have realized now, is that it's always better to have proprietary software as a revenue stream. And having as many options open as possible is always better for a company whose main goal is to generate <coughs> revenue, which is any for-profit company's primary goal. So all those arguments, and this is why you know, is Stallman gets so much trouble about saying free software is different than open source, and, and I really believe it is because I think those original open source arguments that Tim O'Reilly was really partly the originator of, this idea that putting stuff upstream helps you out is, is true, and that's something companies can get on board with. And they will upstream stuff when it's useful for them to upstream stuff, and when they don't see the value in upstreaming, they keep it proprietary. This is why non-copyleft licenses are so useful to them. And it's become a center of the thinking of the new generation of startups, the new generation of for-profit companies. At Oscon last year, last July, this fellow gives a keynote, one of the co-founders of GitHub, for a proprietary network service application which is implemented of a mix of non-shared server-side software and proprietarily licensed JavaScript. And he comes to OSCON 2013 and says, the GPL is full of restrictions. It's a restrictive license, such a restrictive license. Just put the F and MIT on your code and be done with it. That's the right thing to do. Now, I don't see GitHub's source code being MIT. So this is a disingenuous <laughs> argument at best. But they want to be a universal <laughs> receiver. They want to get as much code as they can under a permissive license. And when they finally started encouraging their projects on GitHub to put a license, they pushed them towards the non-copyleft licenses. The amazing thing was is when, where Microsoft failed, everyone else is succeeding. And it's not that it's a conspiracy of many companies now trying to do it. It's, they're not even coordinated. It's this phrase I came up with for this slide, a spontaneous alignment of independent self-interest. There are lots and lots of entities now that want to co-opt open source and free software. And they are all trying at the same time to convince people that copyleft is bad because copyleft is generally bad for them. Or maybe it's not bad for them, but non-copyleft licenses are generally much better for them. So they're all trying to create this meaning of, oh, nobody likes copyleft anymore, it's full of restrictions, it's too hard to comply with, and the clients, oh, just, just forget it all and use MIT. And they all have this message all independently at the same time. So at first I thought it was a conspiracy because I like to be a conspiracy theorist, but it's not. It's just everybody has come to the same conclusion that you can make more money with non-copyleft than you can with copyleft, which is basically true. On the other hand, GNU plus Linux systems are widely more popular than BSD. Now, there's a few amazing things we've gotten from the BSD world. I use SSH every day. Almost all our TCP IP implementations, including the one in Linux, are come more or less from Sam Leffler's original implementation of TCP IP he did in the 70s, which was amazing. And Apple has kept the BSDs alive, more or less, by understanding that sending just enough code upstream to keep the core from dying will get them what they want. 
And we're back to this classic argument, which is the real argument between permissive licensing and copyleft, which is the trade-off between do you want your code to be popular or do you want it to be free as in freedom? And no one in the copyleft world has ever disputed that you can be more popular by not standing up for software freedom. And I think that people forget that the copyleft folks have been saying that since the beginning. We don't claim, when we advocate for copyleft, that people will think your software is the best and most, the one they're dying to use, they're dying to adopt, but if they do adopt it, you can be sure that they won't take away your software freedom. And it's going to happen with LLVM. I, I try to avoid making public predictions. I actually have this place on my website where I have SHA-256 sums of predictions that I've made. So I can prove later that I made the predictions, but I don't have to say that what I was trying to predict if it doesn't come true. Um, which is very engineered to make me look good, right? But, um, but here I'll make a prediction. LLVM is going to have the same thing happen to it. Over time, we will have lots and lots of proprietary plugins and improvements to LLVM. And by the time folks really get fed up with this, GCC will have lost a lot of ground. And more and more people will be using LLVM and suddenly discover that LLVM generates correct code, no problem, no trouble at all. But if you want the code to run fast, here's the stack of proprietary optimizations that you have to license. All the plugins you have to buy to actually make the code run fast. It'll run correct, just slow, if you use the free software one. And that's exactly what Apple and Qualcomm want. It's exactly why they're dumping so much resource into upstream LLVM, because they've made this calculation. Correct code, free software. Optimized code, proprietary software. I actually think it's all, that game's over, though. I think we played the stalemate on the operating system stack. We got the kernel under copyleft. We got most everything else is free software. And pretty much everything you take from the low VM level up to the application space is pretty much free software. And everybody's sort of in a truce about even if it's permissive, it'll still be free software. The kernel's copy, uh, copy left. We'll get more to that later. But the proprietor will more or less got everything else. It's not that we don't have free software applications, but there are a lot of proprietary applications. There are a lot of proprietary web services, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Now, the other weird thing that happened through this is the software in general, not just free software, not just proprietary, all of it has gotten a lot better in the last 10 years. It's hard to see if you've been in the industry because it's all incremental improvement. But things are better. And we have two sort of new worlds where the licensing of software is going to play out. We've got, on the one hand, most applications now are delivered in the browser through a mix of JavaScript, which is downloaded into your browser, and some trade secret server-side never released software uh, that lives with the company who produced it. And the embedded device, which is the almost a computer, but not really because it's hard to upgrade kind of thing, like your mobile phones and your tablets and everything else. They're general purpose computers in all the senses we as technologists know, but they're not really general purpose computers because they're so hard to upgrade because the carriers and the manufacturers have made it really difficult to modify and upgrade those devices. That worries me, by the way, but what worries me more is how JavaScript works and how people perceive it. I think of JavaScript not as a scripting language on the web, but as a really easy way to install software quickly on your computer and have it look like it's just hitting an HTML page. Because ultimately, every time you get a .js file in your browser, the browser you're using installs quickly proprietary software, usually, that JavaScript file on your computer and runs it in a VM. It's really no different than apt-get install something. It just happens quickly without a lot of user intervention. And this has blurred the line of source and object code for a couple of different reasons, in part because people say, well, JavaScript's all source code, so that's great. But there's minifiers, and there's more and more compilers that compile down to JavaScript. 
Microsoft executives get this, or Microsoft uh, technologists get this rather, they've said, oh yeah, it's, uh, this is just the assembly, the assembly language of the web is JavaScript, Microsoft said in, in 2010. So it's, sub, it's a subtle issue. It's, it's hard to see sometimes that that's what's happening and that this is really just proprietary software distribution, but that's effectively what it is. And John gave a talk completely about this one slide yesterday, which, which I hope if you didn't see it, you'll go and see the video. But the bigger issue I'm concerned about here is those who do JavaScript, those who do web applications and live as web application developers have a whole different feel about how they interact with their software and their software development process. This is a story I used to always tell in my talks about free software back, in, back uh, 10, 15 years ago. And it's worth telling again here because it sort of explains the true difference between the old school free software hackers like me and the younger generation of free software hackers like Tom Preston Warner and the like. One of the first experiences I had that convinced me that proprietary software was, was, a, moral, uh, was a moral abomination was dealing with this time when I worked at Westinghouse for a year. And we used Solaris and we used NIS Plus, which was Solaris's recommended authentication system, both of which were proprietary software. We used X, which was at one time free software, but Sun had forked and proprietarized it. And so I, I had this bug in XDM <coughs> regarding logins where people couldn't log in if it had been more than 12 hours because the NIS plus Kerberos ticket timed out. And the only way to log in via XDM was to log in remotely, and then it updated the Kerberos ticket. Then you could log into XDM again. So every morning, people would come in and go around each other's desks to see who was still logged in and then RSH into their own box and then they could go back and the next DM would suddenly work. And then just sort of wander around looking for a terminal to log into to make their own terminal work. So I was hired as a sysadmin. This was one of the first bugs they asked me to look into and I found the bug in XDM. I chased it. I chased it, of course, I have source code. So I chased it with strace <laughs> down from XDM, down to NIS Plus, down to the kernel, right? And opened a bug with Sun. And Sun said, oh, sorry about that bad RD, right quote. Um, Sun says, well, you, you know, Westinghouse is too small of a company, which at that point it was thousands of employees. So I don't know, it's too small. So Sun doesn't fix the bug. And this kind of experience turned me into a free software zealot because I discovered that anytime you chase a bug, you end up frequently having to chase it all the way up and down a stack. And if any piece of that stack is proprietary software, you're screwed because you don't have the source code to fix it yourself. And the vendor is going to tell you. I don't think this happens to anybody anymore. Not really. And the reason is, is one reason is proprietary software got better. I think that when you run a Mac, I see lots of web developers who mostly write even open source software, they like to run Macs, and I think that they don't face that experience with their Mac. There are, I'm sure there are bugs in, in Mac OS, I'm sure there must be, right? But I don't think there's as many bugs in Mac OS as we had in all our operating systems 10 years ago. And so I think people are just sort of like, well, if it just works, I don't face the problem of, darn, this bug is keeping me from getting my job done, which I had all the time when I first encountered proprietary software. And meanwhile, it's, everything's more complex. So even if you're running a good Linux system, I can no longer chase a bug into Linux because I don't have enough background knowledge and it would, the time investment would be too high. So while it's free software, I can't fix the bug myself, even me, and any JavaScript engineer is unlikely to try and chase a kernel bug, even if that is causing problem in their JavaScript application. The other weird thing that's happened is the, why is Gnome doing this to me? <laughs> I'm just teasing you. It's just popping up my network and it can be disconnected. Um, so the, the, the layers of these proprietorization got thinner. So it's not like there's a giant stack at each level of proprietorized software. There's little tiny thin layers uh, in the JavaScript stack, uh, for example. So I sort of see the web development as this kind of disjointed stack. And you rarely have all the source code because you, you get these JSON APIs from all over the place. So if, you, if you're a JavaScript developer and you want to throw a map up on a page, you have a JSON API from, from, from Google for Google Maps, and it generally works, so you just use that. And if it breaks, well, it's, it's annoying, but on the other hand, you're so used to the fact that you have to go and grab all these APIs over the web, and that's the way you've always worked. So you never really thought about the fact that some of this is proprietary and some of this is not. And you're just used to not having all the source on hand, but you're used to having most of the source on hand. So developers who grew up in the world of the web 
had most of the source code from start. I had almost none when I started programming. I had, was relying on everything proprietary, and I had source code for a very tiny sliver of what I did. They have source code for almost everything except for the stuff that's really hard, and then there's some JSON API from some company. Now, meanwhile, there was never a copyleft license for the web, not really. I helped write the Affero GPL, but it never gained wide adoption. It was never well known to these communities who developed for the web. So they only ever really had permissive licenses. So when you think about that Tom Preston Warner quote and say, well, wait a second, if he's going to do everything as a server side technology, if it's GPL, he doesn't have to distribute it, which means he can keep it not shared with the community, private. And that's no different than if it were permissively licensed under, say, a BSD license. So that, that whole license space from the most permissive, say, ISC license all the way to GPL, that entire space of licensing collapses into the same implication when you're writing a server-side application. If it's a Faro GPL, there's actually a copy left there, but a Faro GPL isn't widely adopted. And these people who lived in a world effectively without copy left are the ones who formed all these startup companies now, right? And it's imploring all these people who simply say, well, I don't, you, you don't really need copyleft. What do you need copyleft for? And these employers are happy to let their employees spend some of their time contributing to upstream non-copylefted projects. And I don't blame developers for making this choice. I know a developer who works for a major, huge, non-copylefted project. And this fellow is one of the most zealously copyleft advocates I know. And he's sort of pushed around and tried to say, well, why don't we copy left this? Why don't we copy left that? Wouldn't it be great if this were under the Affair or GPL? But on the other hand, he's got a job writing free software full time. It's hard for me to give him a hard time about the fact that every line of code he writes gets released, so he's really doing the movement's work, as it were. And the compromise is easy to make, right? It's, it's easy to say, well, if you're going to let me write 100% open source and free software, and your only requirement employer is that I never use a copyleft license, I think as a, if I were a developer, I'd have a hard time passing up a nice, cushy job to let me do that, because I'm writing free software. I'm still doing the right thing. But politically, I might not be using the optimal strategy. So one of the things that someone pointed out to me last night was that us old school folks spent a lot of time reinventing a lot of wheels because so much thing was so many things were proprietary. This hasn't happened in the JavaScript world yet. It's starting to. But when they have that experience of having to reinvent everything over and over again, I, I think I hope I shouldn't say I think I hope they'll start to pine for copyleft. When they switch companies and realize that the software they left behind doesn't come with them because it was a mix of some stuff that was released and some stuff that was kept proprietary. And they said, well, wow, I have to re-implement that, I have to re-implement that. A lot of us did that back in the day, right? I mean, a lot, when we switched jobs, we had to rewrite code that we'd already written at the old job, because the old job didn't let us release it as free software. And so I think that's when you start to really want copyleft, and I think that's the way to make the co-option stop working. Because if the companies keep saying, no, I'm only going to permissively license this, you're not, you can't copyleft anything, and we're going to have these little add-ons to the permissive license stuff that we keep private, they'll say, well, the people will start to say, well, my last job when they did that, I got screwed. So maybe I won't do that this time. I don't know if that'll happen fast. It may take an entire generation of developers to live through this before it gets anywhere. So we kind of have to re -bootstrap. And I'm going to finish up and, and take questions in just a minute. I, I struggled with whether, whether to talk about this issue of enforcement uh, in this talk, but I think it actually is related. And I guess it wouldn't be a talk for me if I didn't throw enforcement in there anyway. Um, so I, I think what's happened right now in this, this new battle we're having is we played the stalemate and the only copy left to program left that really is gonna have some teeth to it and weight is gonna be Linux. Companies are starting to realize, the embedded side is starting to realize we can rewrite everything except for Linux. I started doing a ton of enforcement on BusyBox, as most of you know, and what did Android do? I said, well, wait a second, how many lines of BusyBox do we really need in Android? Not very much. Let's just write this little tiny toolbox thing that does the little pieces of a knit and a few other things that we actually need, because if we release that under a permissive license, Bradley won't come and enforce. And Chris Devona has told me directly, yeah, we didn't want you to enforce against us, so we did that. 
No, because we can't control our AMs. I don't think Google's ever going to be out of compliance, but they can't control HTC and all these other people who adopt Android who will violate. And so he said, well, you know, this was easier. And I point out to him, Linux is GPL, and the answer is, well, we can't do without Linux. We're not going to Even Google won't take on the task of rewriting Linux from scratch. Yeah. And so that says something, right? Because Google will rewrite anything they want. They're rewriting the whole browser. They write the whole browser. They're like, oh, we, well, we're done with Firefox. Let's just write Chrome from scratch, right? Google will take on a write from scratch a lot, but not on Linux. And that's the key to copyleft that I think even many of us copyleft advocates forgot. Copyleft only works when there's code that people can't live without. The people won't dare try to re-implement from scratch. And Linux may be the last program we have that has that part to it. Now the problem with Linux is that it's not treated like it's GPL by the industry. It's treated like it's LGPL by the industry. And so the co-option of free software pushes from that side as well. So, so the folks who have adopted Linux roughly treat it as if it were LGPL. And I'm talking about proprietary kernel modules, of course. And say, well, uh, we can make proprietary kernel modules, and nobody's coming after us, and we'll just keep getting away with it, and eventually the industry will just decide. And developers sort of in this weird spot again with, well, I work on Linux, and the core all gets made GPL'd, and the fact that there's a proprietary module here and there, maybe I can live with that. And the compromises get tough. <laughs> now, um, many, if you read my blog, you know my favorite movie is uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which is probably not as well known in Europe as it is in the US because it's uh, aired almost constantly uh, from November, from, from the Thanksgiving holiday in the US until, until December 25th on television. So I grew up watching this like four times a year in November and December. There's this really interesting scene, and I think it relates to copyleft and, and the belief in copyleft, because there's a lot of companies out there who are more or less friendly to copyleft, they're Linux companies, right? So the Linux is GPL, um, and they say, well, we're okay with the GPL, but we don't want it to be enforced. And, and I, I have this weird, there's this weird exchange in the movie. So, so in, the, in the movie, spoiler alert, leave if you haven't seen It's Wonderful Life, I don't know. But, um, so they have this conversation where this angel comes to, to help George out, who's in a, who's in a crisis of, of morality and, and such. And they have this conversation in a bar where Clarence, this angel, is telling everybody he's an angel. And George says, well, don't, don't tell people that around here. And, George says, and, and Clarence says, well, they don't believe in angels? He goes, well, well, they believe in angels. And he says, well, shouldn't be surprised when you see one. So if you believe in copyleft, you shouldn't be surprised when copyleft gets enforced. But the companies who use Linux are very unhappy with the idea of copyleft being enforced, most of them anyway. And so that's a fundamental hypocrisy. That's part of that co-option of copyleft by companies who, who are, are, are heavily invested in Linux. And it's now become the most common position among those companies. That, oh no, copyleft, it's just a beautiful symbol of our, of our community. <laughs> it's a symbol. When I heard that, I thought of this quote I heard. Now this is where the religion comes in. So Flannery O'Connor, I, I, I went to a, I, I was a Catholic for many years, I'm an atheist now, but I was a Catholic for many, many years. And uh, I loved Flannery O'Connor, and I did this uh, huge paper in one of my classes when I was in Jesuit college, uh, when I went to undergraduate uh, at a Jesuit university. And she is discussing the Eucharist, and, the, and this is really relig heavy religion here. So Roman Catholics believe that the Eucharist is literally, not figuratively, literally the body of Jesus Christ, physically. They transmogrifies, it's called transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, trans I like transmogrifies better, better because it's much more yes. science fiction y. Yes. But yes, they call it, if you are quite correct, Kevin, they call it transubstantiation. Yes. And Protestants, this was actually one of the things Luther. Martin Luther objected to, this idea of transubstantiation. So most Protestants don't believe this. And in debates with Protestants, Flannery kind of answers, well, if it's just a symbol, if it's just a symbol of Christ's body, to hell with it. And that's how I feel about the GPL. If it's just a symbol, let's just all go to non-copyright licenses. If it's just a, oh yeah, we believe in the software should be free, but when it's violated, we don't care. Let's just all go, let's do what Jim Jack says. We'll all go use the Apache license. I believe fundamentally, and I was misquoted by someone last year when I said this uh, at this uh, track last year, an unenforced copyleft is the moral equivalent of a non-copyleft license. So, it's a <coughs> functional equivalent on the side. You said moral, but in the slide... But moral, functional, yeah, the point is it's, it's not literally the equivalent. Okay. It's not literal. 
Was I the one who misquoted you? No, I don't want to. I've already had conversation with persons did, so I won't. I won't mind. So someone did. It was not you. Okay, that's what I was. <laughs> so we've got we've got to reestablish the copy left on Linux, and enforcement is the only way to do it. This is why I do enforcement on Linux because that's the way to fight the co-option from that side. But more importantly than that. That's my job, okay? I know nobody else is gonna actually do enforcement except for me at this point. So I'll take care of the enforcement. What the rest of you have to do is start coding and copy left your stuff. We need a lot more code. And those of you that are old school hackers, go go hang out in the Node.js community. I, I, I know there I know there's a lot of programmers there, okay? But but go and talk to them because this this is this is the future of software and it's there for the future of free software, these JavaScript people. And Whatever, and maybe that is okay. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But whatever the kids are into, don't get into it. But right? you got to. We, we we can't just say, oh, we got copy left over here on Debian, but right. We, we're, Debian developers have to go join these other communities too. All the, all the, all us old school free software people, we've got to we've got to get into what the kids are into. And the other important thing is is we need to go back to coding on our own time. There was a a a, a, a idea of vol volunteerism in free software when I started. Because most everybody was employed writing proprietary software, and the nights and weekends they wrote free software. Because their employer had no interest whatsoever in letting them write free software in those days. Now, because employers, well, okay, you can write a little free software, but it's got to be under a non copyleft license, we've got to start coding on our own time. And make sure your employer lets you keep your own copyrights. And make sure you license them under a copyleft, preferably <laughs> the Afero GPL. We've got to create the world we want. And this is what free software has always been about. And we're at a point now where there's not enough coding. I, I think Chris Weber's presentation yesterday was a good exception to this. But generally speaking, there's not a lot of community-oriented volunteerism coding to build the world of free software that we want. More and more people just use GitHub. They're just sort of like, ah, GitHub's proprietary, but well, what are you going to do? We, we can't have that anymore. We've got to actually fight for the free software world we want, which means we have to write our own code and we have to copy it. Remember, that's why Linux is copyleft. Linus didn't start Linux with the Linux Foundation with a bunch of companies supporting it in place. He started as a student and was a fan of GCC, so he copylefted it. He regretted that decision later, and then he was for it again once GPLv3 came out, which was nice. But the point is, is all these little programs, like Samba, like GNU, that were copyleft and were done because people were like, I've got to write this so that there is software freedom in the world. Not because my company's willing, me to pay, willing to pay for me for it. Take the free software job and write permissively licensed stuff. I'm okay with that. But maybe, maybe write some copyleft stuff on the weekends. So that's pretty much all I have to say. And I've, I've left about 15 minutes for Q&A. So, so I'm happy to talk about any topic you want. Um, but I'm curious to hear folks' feedback on, on what, what the future of copyleft is for all of us. Uh, what I've uh, received so far from uh, your talk is that uh, is the impression that copyleft is bad for business in a, in a way, and uh, I'm I'm wondering uh, could we do something to prove that it's not bad for business? Uh, I think there are things like trademarks and uh, time to market uh, that are very valuable. Uh, and much more interesting, who would host his source code on some hub, you go to GitHub, because they were there first, they made it, and uh, I wonder, actually, uh, would it matter if they put their source code for open source? Well, I, think, I think you're right about them? that. I, I wonder whether there would be any competition, actually. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, I, I think the, re the reason, I, 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 I take the criticism, and I, I see why you're saying that. Um, but I think this, this question of, of adoption versus software freedom is, is the fundamental question. And, and that, that idea that businesses don't like to close off their options. And locking themselves into copyleft space is going to close off options. There are business models not available to you if your software is copylefted that are available to you. And even if their goal is to mostly do free software, they don't want to close off their options. I don't think GPL is bad for business. In fact, I think it's good for business. I wrote an essay 15 years, well, not 15, but 12 years ago now, when Microsoft was doing those attacks, that, that I felt as someone who was an independent contractor, which I mostly was, 
uh, before I started getting all this free software politics and nonprofits, that, that it was really good for my business because I had knowledge that I could port. And because it was copylefted, I knew this code would be roughly the same or almost exactly the same at the next place I went to uh, to contract so I could transfer the skills. But once you get a business that's large enough, a startup, i.e. VC funded startups, uh, I think I think that it's hard to make the case that, that producing the things that the proprietary system gives you, like your own copyrights, your own patents, your own, et cetera, um, any VC is going to want that. And so it's very difficult to talk to someone who wants to start a business and say, you should close off these options because it's right for software freedom. I've been making that argument for 10 years with companies that it's better for them to make a moral choice. I don't think we can convince companies to make a moral choice. They're going to do what they have to do. They use Linux because they have to, not because they want to. Sometimes I think companies just don't have business models. I'm working for a Linux distribution that's completely licensed under the AGP. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're doing it for 10 years now, mm -hmm. uh, and very successfully we target the enterprise market. And actually the, the users, they don't understand licenses, they don't mm -hmm. understand uh, code, they just want support. Yeah, no, and I think that model works. I mean, my, my hope would be that you never sell, them a, sell a proprietary license for that AGPL code. Can you guarantee me you don't do that? <laughs> okay, so you're part of the problem, right? I mean, I, I'm sorry, but you're part of the problem because you're, you're basically saying it's better to buy the proprietary license. What I wish you were telling your customers is you want to use this under a fair GPL because it protects you from us. Right? It protects you from, from us ever proprietarizing it because it's always going to be free. It's not always going to be free because you collect all the copyrights, right? Right. But this is also something we managed to move to GPL, a GPL because of that. Before we added a license under GPL and uh, because we had the copyrights, we were able to change to AGPL. You could have changed to AGPL anyway. But that's a separate conversation. Because you could have, if it's GPL v3, you can add AGPL new code and it would slowly migrate. So you didn't need the copyrights to do that. But you do need the copyrights to try and get people to buy a proprietary license for the free software code. You should be trying to get them to, as you say, to buy support for the free software code, not buy a proprietary license for the software code. That's my opinion. Being the devil's advocate a little bit for small companies that release things under Apache licenses, I think that most people don't say, oh, we'll keep all the options open. Most people say, oh, we would like to have adoption. And yeah, it's yeah. easy to, to see that, that some large company might come and use this in, in the preview, and it would be good for us. And we'll uh, have sort of the convenience of having the same license as the rest of the stack in a Java service side. Yeah, and, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not arguing the Apache license shouldn't exist. I think there are, I, I even supported Pumpio's decision to choose Apache license for the adoption reason because there were bigger uh, protocol issues at stake that we want those distributed protocols adopted more than we want the code necessarily to be free in that specific case. I think the adoption versus software freedom debate and trade-off should be considered even by free software developers in the sense that some free software developers should write non-copyleft code. I think the issue I have is, is rarely do I think it's only about the adoption. I think that's probably the public argument many of them make. Um, but privately, I would bet that it's keeping options open. I bet that that's part of the calculus. Uh, I don't think everything needs to be under a permissive license. In fact, very little stuff, in my view, should be under a permissive license. It shouldn't cease to exist. But there's this pressure to say, oh, we'll pick that because we'll get more adoption. And what? It th makes me think of that South Park episode where, where step one, get adoption, step two, Step three, profit, right? I mean, that's their view about it, that they think somehow, and, and this is part of the zeitgeist. This is the idea that you'll, get, you, you, you'll be better off. And I think it relates to the, to the kind of VC-funded culture. The VC-funded culture is adoption, 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 and quick sell ads, and you'll make some money. And because we've got that culture of how we do technology now, it, I think it creates that kind of meme to say, well, keep your options open because we don't know what our business model is. It sort of goes with what you're saying. We don't know what our business model is yet. And starting a company before you know what your business model is, is, is bizarre to me. But that's how most companies start now. It's the pivot model. Pivot. Pivot. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? We have plenty of time. All right. Um, so I wanted to uh, actually like the idea of uh, and I wanted to write. Uh, the idea of, I'm sorry. I do like the idea of Copilot, and I mm -hmm. wanted to write an AGPL server-side program. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to write it in Clojure, which is where, where all the libraries and Clojure itself is under EPL, I think, the Eclipse license. And I suppose I could understand at that point um, 
AGPL, MEPL, I know it doesn't work. That's true. Yeah. That's so unfortunate, when you but talk about true. Like, it's usually GPL, but there's a bunch of copyright licenses which usually are mutual with us. So is it at all possible to get to a world where um, I would write a software that could be used in any other copyright contract rather than under the specific license I use? Yeah, well, Fontana thinks so. I, I mean, because uh, that's why he's writing copyleft next. He's going to universalize yeah. copyleft. But uh, yeah, I, I think it, I think it's a tough problem because because copyleft is fundamentally designed as a magnet to pull code towards it. And if you have two magnets, what do they do, right? Uh, if you try to put them together. So so Eclipse Public License is this very very weak magnet that gets in the way, in my view, uh, because it's not a very strong copyleft. It, it it may be stronger, may be weaker than LDPL. I'm not really sure. But if, if you have something about it, if you're starting a new project, I mean, the, the FSF itself has authorized this. You can um, add an exception, an additional permission. Saying, That's true. You know, you can Good point. I think you so. can combine with with um, uh, EPL license code. This is there are some problems with this. It kind of relies on on copyright control. Yeah. Um, so if you don't do that at the beginning and you get a lot of contributors, it becomes a more difficult issue. Yeah, but if you're starting, that's true. That Fontana makes a great point that I should have made. It, 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 write an exception that allows for com combination with that spirit thing. So let me see if I understand that, because I think it's a subtle point. If I start a closure project and I or my contributors all have aggregated copyright, we could AGPL our closure program even though closure core is EPL. Well, you, right, you, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be perfectly AGPL. It'd be AGPL plus an exception that specifically permits combination with the Eclipse public license stuff, but the affair of law is still applied. This, so. this also relates to the uh, idea that you have suggested before of having a, a lesser AGPL. Yeah. I mean, that may be for other it's, Yeah, it's other purposes probably. But yes, we should do that. Somebody was asking about that in an earlier session, actually. More questions? Um, you're talking from the perspective of the developer. And I was thinking about perspective from the user. Mm -hmm. And take um, Linux kernel, for example. I get some code, a big uh, whole work, and most of it says, oh, you can use anything w w you want with it. Here's the license, here's that. And then I get the proprietary driver connected to it. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a legal issue from my point of view, because I get too many this. One said, and I'm not allowed to, and then said, I have right to do it. Right. But I have no real enforcement rights. I have nothing I can do about I know. it. Oh, and yeah. that Tough seems problem. to be a different and, 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 and political. And, and again, Fontana's looked into this question. I, I, that's, the, that's the biggest, I actually believe that's the biggest flaw of copyleft, which is that the, the, the rights are for the user. I agree with you about that. But the person who has the ability to enforce those rights is only the copyright holder. It's a it's a bug in the system, and it, it relates to the fact that we hacked copyright. I mean, copyright wasn't designed to do copyleft. RMS <laughs> invented it as an idea, and like anything, where you try to you know take something and fit it into fit a round peg into a square hole, they, you get, eventually get it in there, but it's it's not there's there's little shavings. And I think this this users don't have standing for enforcement is one of those shavings, and so and so I, that concerns me, and it's one of the reasons I was so upset. Like I became so obsessed with trying to do enforcement for Linux because users consistently hate proprietary drivers, um, but, but a very small segment, Frank, I'll be frank about that, a very small segment of the copyright holders of Linux actually care, in part because there's so many corporate copyright holders in Linux, but there is a nice group of individual copyright holders who care. I don't like the fact that I have to stand up for everybody. Uh, it's tough, because I have to stand up for all the users because I built a coalition of copyright holders who can now get the rights for the user. I think if we could find a way in future versions of copyleft, which, which Fontana talked about last year and, and is investigating, for users to have standing for enforcement, I think that would be wonderful. But I, I, we don't have a solution to that now, and we've got problems right now. I'll get you in a second, Ian, because I have another one back here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm not too familiar with copyleft next, only that I know it exists and sounds pretty cool. Um, what is the, uh, is there an equivalent of an Afro clause in it? He refuses to put one, he rejected my patch. Actually, so, so <laughs> uh, there is a patch, I wrote it, and he well, won't take it. <laughs> so, so because of turmoil in my personal life and everything, uh, uh, I, I've, it's, it's been on hold, but I, when, I, when I get back to it, hopefully after Fosdom, um, I actually do want to focus on, and you've kind of convinced me that this, it's important to have a kind of by default an affair type policy. So I won. Not, okay, not just you, but also um, <laughs> uh, warp if you still remember. And yeah. Um, so, so. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's yeah. always been. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, possible. at this point, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think Fontana will be insulted when I say Copyleft Next is a, is an experimental research project to think about 
the copyleft, but it's long term in the sense that we've got problems we've got to solve now with the copyleft licenses we have, and we can't yeah. wait for, for you to finish. This uh, is I'm this sorry, is, we this can't. Is, no, it's, this is <laughs> yeah. a 20 year. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think that's right. And I, I think we need to be, I mean, we need to be working on multiple fronts at once. So I'm glad Fontana is working on it, but it's not going to solve our problems today. Go ahead, Ian. Right. I, I know you, you generally, the free software, the, at least the FSF licenses, are all just licenses and not contracts. But a possible benefit of making them into contracts that you would benefit, I don't know if you have anything like this in the US, but in Britain we have a thing called the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act. It is now possible for a contract, you know, I can get into a contract with you and as a result of me giving you the software, you could be suable by all the users that I intended to benefit if you violate it. I, I, and I, and I, I'll, I, you know, I'll, I'll be, I'll be very, free, yeah, because I, I never, I never hold back. You all, you all know that. So, so well, I'll, I'll say something that's rather, rather a mistake for me to say as a director, uh, board of directors of FSF. But I actually think it's, it's quite possible the FSF has been making a mistake for a long time with regard to saying GPL is never a contract. Um, and, and Jacobson, the, the U.S. case, Jacobson v. Katzner, it started to convince me of this because. It, 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 it seemed to us hell. Yeah, you think I'm saying something wrong, Karen? I think it's, it held that you could seek both copyright and contract remedies upon violation of a, of, a, of a free software license. And so if that's true in the U.S. courts, that was always our big worry, is that somehow if you tried to pursue contract remedies, you could no longer pursue the copyright remedies. But I, I think that that's probably not true. And, and maybe there's no jurisdiction where that is true. If, if so, then we should pursue all the remedies we have. We should, Copyleft was always designed to use the legal system to the maximum extent it could to ensure software freedom. And your point is quite correct. If we could simultaneously call it a contract and a copyright license, seek both remedies at once, per, I'd probably want to argue the contract remedies in the alternative. But if that's the case, then maybe we do have it. And there was actually a guy in Australia who was looking into Australia's consumer fraud law and chasing enforcement on that, which was a neat idea. He was saying basically, you committed fraud by failing to inform me about the GPL because you misrepresented the software to me when you gave it to me. Um, and he had a little bit of success. We got that person into compliance, but we never got uh, jurisprudence in Australia where he actually sued because he bas basically a threat was enough to get them into compliance. So, yeah, he's, he's talking about a somewhat different problem. So you're talking about maybe contract remedies for the, the upstream copyright holder. You're talking about can uh, the user, user, yeah, I know, I get user have contract Right, and, and it could be the case, right. and it just would work out that, that the user bringing contract claims because they couldn't bring the copyright claim would not impact the ability for the copyright holder to also bring a copyright claim separately or later. I think that would be fine. I think we don't know the answer to that, and I think the mistake that we made was this, this just uh, almost single-minded, it is not a contract that was beaten into our head by lawyers who had other agendas. I think we, I think we need to reconsider that. I don't know the answer yet. I think we have to think about it first. But I think I think you're on to something. There, is I guess my point. Go ahead. Kieran has hand up first. So you mentioned that one solution is that we should be writing free software under copyright left licenses in our free time. Uh, do you agree also that we should be promoting the, the choice of using free so uh, copyright left software uh, when there are multiple choices? For example, if I need a, a video editor or an IRC client, I can choose uh, different packages, and some are copyright left, some aren't. Should we also be uh, encouraging people to? You prefer copyleft to free software as a user? Um, I, I, th I think at this point we've we've got to get a little more serious about. It. I'm trying to get back to a specific slide. Just uh, give me a second here. You know this this truce. Uh, it's taking too long um, to go backwards. Uh, the truce that we we have, right? This 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 unwritten truce with the permissive license guys that we had. I will get to that slide eventually. Uh, I I don't think I I don't think they're honoring that truce anymore. I mean, it was never like handshake agreement, it was just sort of implicit. Uh, I see the Apache guys going off the copy left all the time now. I don't think we really need to keep the truce going per se. I don't think we should be mean, but I think we should just be a stalwart advocates for what we believe and let them be stalwart advocates for what they believe. I don't think we have to fear someone coming trying to use the fault line anymore. So I think actually we should use every advocacy tool we have, including the one you mentioned, to try and tell people copy left is great and you should prefer copy left. We should be willing to say that and not be ashamed about saying, oh, well, you know, you have your choice of license. We, it's like, we know you have a choice in licensing, and we hope you pick the copyleft. We don't have to be that, that, that sort of uh, giving up. We can just say, copyleft's right, you should pick it. If you make it the contract, can you still disclaim a warranty? Yeah, I, I mean, you, yeah. you, you can. Uh, it, it's kind of, it, you're raising an important issue, right? We haven't, we haven't been researching this thing. I think that's the mistake, was we, we, we were just in this only a license, never a contract mantra, and we, we didn't spend the time researching these kinds of questions. 
And so, uh, you know, he yeah, says yes, but... As a matter of fact, it, it, it there's, depends there's on an argument that, right? that a warranty disclaimer doesn't make any sense if you're, if you're saying that a copyright license is not contractual. Because oh, interesting. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless Ken doesn't want that. I think I have time for one more question. Is that right? One more question. Who gets it? So, how long do you think that generation will last? <laughs> I have no idea. It could be multiple generations. I, I had the belief a while ago um, that we're, we're entering the dark ages that will last probably like 50 years. Um, maybe that's an overestimate. Um, maybe it's only 15. Right. But I, I don't think it's less than 10. Let's put it that way. Uh, I, th I think we're in the d we're in the dark ages of free software. We're we're, we're going to be the I mean, people will be bitten by you know, proprietary <laughs> things done to permissive license stuff in less than five years. Uh, but the, the biting won't be as bad. It'll be nipping, right? It'll be yeah. it'll be like when the dog jumps up and nips your finger a little. It won't be the alligator, right? The alligator won't be coming for a while. And until the alligator comes, I don't think people are going to get fed up, right? And also remember, we had like visionaries like Stallman to bail us out when it got really bad. And, and I don't know if we have those visionaries, so that's another problem, right? Because <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not bad, but I'm not a visionary. I admit that. Well, Bradley, thanks for keeping the alligators away. <laughs>